Okay, thank you uh, very much, Matt and Uri. It's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, as Matt has set up, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the trends in democratization that we're seeing across the continent today. And I'm characterizing this as a process of protest, crackdowns, and breakthroughs. Um, and I thought to get started um, that we could uh, take a minute and remember a good friend of the Africa Center. This is General Lamine Sisse. And uh, General Sisse has been a long time collaborator of the Africa Center, and he's participated in many programs in different ways. And we've benefited much from his great integrity and wisdom and experience. Uh, General Sisse passed away this past April in Senegal, and uh, if he hadn't died, I'm sure he would be here with us uh, this week because he believed deeply in issues of military professionalism and civil military relations. And he led a storied career in many different ways. He was uh, the um, director of chief of staff for the general chief of staff for the Senegalese army. Uh, he was the UN special representative uh, in Central African Republic and for West Africa. He was uh, he led peacekeeping missions. He was a leading voice in ECOWAS. There are many things that he did. Um, but there's one uh, period that I wanted to emphasize for our conversation today that you know, is often forgotten in, in thinking about his, his great career. And that was he helped to usher in the process of, uh, the, of, a, of a democratic transition in Senegal. After uh, General Sisse retired from the military in 1998, he was appointed by President Diop at the time to be the Minister of Interior in Senegal. And as part of that responsibility, he was uh, tasked with overseeing the elections, parliamentary and presidential, in Senegal in 2000. And he did that, as he did everything with great integrity and transparency and efficiency. <clears throat> and the elections came off very smoothly. Uh, he had earned the trust of all the different political parties. And when the, election, when the election results came in, it was left to General Sisse to tell President Diaz that he and his party had lost the election. And there were some tense moments where it wasn't clear if President Diaz was going to accept the results. But General Sisse, in his tactful, firm manner, um, and with the support of uh, other allies, uh, impressed on the president that you know, the process had been fair and this was the will of the people. So uh, on the evening of March 19, 2000, uh, President Yoff issued a very gracious uh, speech uh, of a concession. And for the first time, Senegal experienced a transition from one political party to another. Um, and so I, I start with that story because we hear a lot of criticisms and concerns about the state of democratization in Africa today. And I would just hold it up to remind us that these challenges have been with us for a long time. And any advances in democracy in Africa have been the result of courageous individuals who believe in these processes and are willing to take difficult steps to move them forward. I put up this chart, this historical trends uh, chart of democratic progress uh, on the continent to give us a little bit of context for where we are today. And what, what these trend lines show are a number of things that I would emphasize. First is that there's been significant change 
since the wave of democratization first began in Africa in the early 1990s. At that time, nearly every country had an authoritarian system. There weren't elections. Since that time, you can see the black line has declined dramatically. Uh, the number of authoritarian countries has uh, diminished. Uh, nearly every country today has some form of elections. Uh, they vary, of course, in quality and level of participation. Um, the number of democracies, the blue line has increased uh, slowly, uh, but uh, there are more democratic systems than there were uh, at the beginning of, of this transition. But most notably is the number of countries that are in between these intermediate regimes, countries that have taken some steps towards democratization, but haven't really become the genuine democracy that uh, Matt was referring to. And I think that's where I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just understanding where that gap is, because I think that really helps us to focus on the challenges of democratization in Africa today. And I would throw out a couple of different points that explain the gap between the intermediate regimes and the democracies. Um, this first is that something Matt picked up on, that democracy is not, a, is not just about elections. You know, democracy is not an event on one day. Democracy is a process of governing every day. And as part of that process, it's a matter of respecting basic rights, political civil rights for everybody um, every day. And that, that's, that includes respecting rights of minorities, minority ethnicities, minority regions, minority religions, minority political parties. So just because you lose an election doesn't mean you lose your rights in a democracy. Those things are respected. Conversely, just because you win an election, that doesn't give you the right then to force your will on the rest of the population. You still need to abide by the rule of law and do things through the processes that are um, established. In the same way, in a, in a democracy, we have leaders but not rulers. It's an important distinction that differentiates democracies from any other form of government. In democracy, your power comes from the legitimacy you get from the people. Your authority comes from the population. And therefore, there's a special relationship between government leaders and their citizens in a democracy. There's an expectation that you need to engage the population in explaining decisions in getting their feedback, in being transparent. Um, and, and ultimately, there's the expectation that there has to be accountability between government leaders and citizens in a democracy. And last thing I would throw out in, in explaining differences between intermediate regimes and democracies is this notion of checks and balances. You know, democracies were set up um, under the assumption that power is corrupting. And as the saying goes, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so the very design of democratic systems is to share power across multiple points of government. Again, with the ultimate authority being the people. Um, and in the end, this is a means of uh, maintaining uh, support for popular priorities, and respecting the rule of law. So let me shift now to talk about where we're going from here in Africa on the democratization side. And I, I would characterize the current, or, or, you know, the current and, and, and the future trajectories as being a result of competing tensions. There are forces that are pushing forward for more democratization, and there are resistant forces that are going to be pulling back. So let's tick through a few of the, of the key factors. The first I would emphasize is African citizens want democracy. In poll after poll, we see that, you know, 70% of, of respondents say democracy is the far and away superior form of government that they want. 
And, and, the, and the same polls recognize that most citizens say, well, we, don't, we have something less than that. There's a sense that the expectations aren't being met. Still, the aspiration for democracy uh, remains very high on the continent. And uh, in the same way, we uh, are seeing protest. Over the last 10 years, the number of protests in Africa has grown rapidly. And these protests are for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, but uh, three main factors uh, come out regularly. First is people are protesting for more democratic rights. Secondly, people are protesting because of they want better service delivery. And third, people are protesting because they're protesting against the current living conditions. And this graphic I've put up shows um, the, uh, the, the location of protest across the continent over an 18 month period recently. Uh, and what we see is the frequency of protest, the fact that these protests are happening uh, in both countries that are more democratic, as well as those um, that are relatively uh, less democratic uh, over time. Uh, and I would say that um, uh, the expectation is we're going to continue to see protest. And I say that because of a couple of reasons. One is the youthful, the youth bulge that we hear in Africa, it's only going to grow. And the youth are the ones who are often leading these protests. It's the youth who have the highest expectations of what they want out of government. You know, they're well connected. They have idea of what expectations are of government in other parts of the world. There's a higher level of education. Um, and they're, they have higher demands. They're not willing to accept the status quo. As African uh, middle class, as Africa's middle class grows, as we're seeing more urbanization, all of these factors are associated with higher demands for democracy. So we can expect more protest. Uh, moving forward. Um, another factor that is contributing, I, I would argue, to positive momentum for democratization is that uh, slowly and une unevenly, we're seeing stronger institutions, uh, institutions, independent institutions, as Matt was talking about, uh, that create checks and balances within a government. And this simple schematic is meant to show that there are often layers of accountability structures in a democracy. It isn't just one source. That inner circle represents the checks and balances within the government, legislatures, civil societies, local government, judiciary, central banks, civil services, professional militaries. All those factors are on the inner circle. The outer circle are the checks and balances from outside of government. And these include things like the private sector, social norms, civil society, the media, uh, regional and international organizations that help to uphold these norms. So it's this combination of factors that helps make a robust democracy. And I, I, I see these things growing across the continent. Again, not everywhere and not always consistently. Um, but as a result of these positive forces, uh, we've seen breakthroughs in certain places that haven't known democracy recently. And so Ethiopia has made uh, a very important uh, first step on the democratization path. Gambia, Burkina Faso have, often, have, have also broken away from many years of authoritarian structures. Places that uh, have had more strict authoritarian systems like Sudan, Algeria, Togo, they're facing protest. They're facing pressure to open up. We'll see where they go. Um, and then in places with more established democratic systems like Nigeria, South Africa, in recent months have held competitive multi-party elections that have reaffirmed the commitment to democratic norms and some of the biggest countries on the continent. So 
the momentum for democratic change remains, and, it, and it's pushing forward on the continent. Yet, there are resistant forces out there, and there are other forces that are going to be pushing back, and that are pushing back. And let me tick through a few of those. The first I would highlight is the uh, continuing influence of populist leaders. So these are leaders who are very personalistic in their governance style. They see themselves as above the rule of law. They are the antithesis of institutional um, leaders that they, they, they reject checks and balances on the uh, use of uh, political authority. Um, and uh, they have been able to push back against some of these institutions uh, that have been uh, that have been growing. It's a legacy of some of the big man political structures and mentality that we have seen in Africa over the years. And a result of, of this style, we've seen certain countries that have previously made good progress on democracy um, backslide <clears throat> somewhat. So countries like Tanzania, Zambia, Benin, um, they, they've stepped back. Um, similarly, with regards to term limits, uh, between the 1990s and 2015, there was great progress on term limits for pre presidents. Um, since then, we've seen six countries, six, six leaders of evade term limits uh, on the continent. So it's another norm that is uh, being pushed. Um, another push, another factor pushing back in some cases um, is the resurfacing of militaries that see themselves as the ultimate bastion of governance in the society. And so I'm referring to countries like Egypt and Sudan, Algeria, and Zimbabwe, where the militaries have very much taken a, a, front, a frontal role in asserting their authority. Another cause for pushback or sliding, sliding back is weak regional bodies. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Africa Charter on Democracy, Governance, and Elections. Uh, it was adopted by the African Union in 20, uh, 2007. And um, since then, 32 countries have ratified the charter. 46 have signed it. You know, the charter um, commits these countries to principles of, of, of democracy and democratic change and respecting rule of law and respecting term limits. Yet when individual leaders uh, resist upholding these principles, unfortunately, regional bodies have been inconsistent in, uh, in uh, holding them accountable. And finally, I would push, put out there the role of international actors that um, we've seen in recent years a more assertive posture of certain international actors like China, Russia, Gulf states, in actually promoting their governance model their authoritarian structures in Africa. Um, and there are economic political reasons for that, but it's also uh, a matter of geopolitical interest where they see value in asserting autocracy as a viable governing model, as an alternative to democracy, because that puts less pressure on them back home to open up. So, the current state of democratization is, uh, is a result of these pushes and pulls. Uh, it's in flux. And importantly for our conversation today, security leaders in Africa are, are in the middle of this. And you often are having to navigate the competing forces between citizens demanding more rights, and leaders who want to maintain exclusive governance structures. And at times, militaries, other security forces are being asked to crack down on, on protesters. And so the question isn't, are African security sectors capable of doing that? Clearly, you know, from a capability standpoint, it doesn't take much to crack down on unarmed protesters. 
the question is, um, what are the cost of doing so? What are the costs to your societies? What are the costs to the demo democratic aspirations? What are the costs to your security institutions when you do that? And how does that affect that relationship between a citizen and government? How does it affect trust and cooperation, which is so indispensable for those sorts of security challenges that African countries are, are facing? Um, and I, I throw this example up of, of Sudan recently, which uh, just on June 3rd, of course, ordered the crackdown on the protesters uh, in Khartoum and elsewhere, resulting over 100 deaths and, and, and other casualties. Um, in, in bringing this towards conclusion, um, I want to talk about why this matters and you know, I, I emphasize it because democracy is more than just an ethical form of government. It actually delivers functionally for concerns about development and security that matter for Africa. These are parties for African citizens. I don't have time to get into some of the developmental linkages, but on the security side, there are 12 uh, ongoing armed conflicts in the, on the continent today. All of these are internal conflicts. Of the 12, 10 of them are in uh, autocratic systems of government. Similarly, we're dealing in a period where there's a record number of forcibly displaced people, internally displaced refugees, et cetera. 25 million people. 90% of those people originate in countries that are autocratically governed. Um, so there's a strong linkage there uh, between uh, governance and, um, uh, and, 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 and security. I mentioned term limits e earlier. Um, for countries with term limits, the average time in office for a leader is four years. For countries without term limits, the average time in office is uh, 18 years. Uh, and, and extending that for countries without term limits, the, uh, the propensity for conflict is about, about a third. About a third of the countries without term limits are in conflict. For those with term limits, it's less than 10%. It's about 8, eight to 9%. So there's a very direct link uh, between governance and security. And so I'll leave you with four takeaways. And the first is that when we talk, we often talk about security and governance as separate concepts, but in Africa, they're closely intertwined. <clears throat> Poor governance, corruption is often a key driver of conflict on the continent. The second takeaway um, is that the state of democratization is in flux, um, and it's dealing with these competing forces. And in every country, it's going to be different. And no country can be taken for granted. You can't put democracy on autopilot. It has to be earned by every generation um, because there will be those who will test the limits. Um, that brings me to the third point that the real challenge for democratization today is building those institutions of accountability, to be, build those checks and balances so that when you have leaders who want to usurp more power, who want to evade these constraints, that they're strong enough to withstand that. That's the real challenge. That's the cause of the gap we have uh, between aspiration and the reality of democratic governance on the continent. And the last point is that as part of strengthening, strengthening those institutions is the importance of strengthening the military professionalism of security institutions so that they can be apolitical they can be independent. They can serve the broader interest of the population, defend the Constitution, the rule of law, and resist what is going to inevitably be efforts to politicize your services. So with that, let me stop, and we'll pick it up the questions and answers.